Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, this is my podcast called Behind You where once a week I sit down and I talk about all things true crime, anything from cults, disappearances, murders, all the way to the biggest drug bust in history, the biggest bank heist in history, all things true crime. So if you're interested in any of that, you can subscribe on the YouTube channel and watch the visual version every Wednesday or head over to Spotify, Apple, or wherever you can find podcasts every Tuesday for the audio version. And if not, totally chill. Like, do not feel pressured to, you know, subscribe or follow or whatever you gotta do. I'm just glad that you're here right now. But specifically today, we are going to be talking about the case of Martin Bryant. There is a lot to get through with this case, so we're just gonna hop right into it. Martin Bryant was born on May 7th of 1967 in Tasmania, Australia. He grew up with his parents, Carlene and Maurice, as well as having a younger sister. During his childhood, he was said to be very defiant. He was always the one getting in trouble. He tended to question the rules very often and get into fights with his parents, his friends, his neighbors. And as a child, he just loved taunting people and making people mad. So sometimes he would like purposely test people's limits. And this was very tough for his parents because they were trying to discipline him, but it just felt like no discipline was working. And it was a very frustrating situation for them to be in. And it got to a point where they didn't even want to be around Martin anymore just because he was that hard to handle. But every time he was left alone, like in his room playing with his toys, his parents would always find his toys ripped up or broken. So as a child, he was very defiant. He was out of control, unmanageable. And then in school, it was the same exact thing. Martin's parents realized that Martin would often disassociate during school, but when he wouldn't be disassociating, same thing at home. He was constantly fighting with other students. He was extremely loud and disruptive, as well as very violent towards the students and the staff. Whenever his little sister brought her friends over to the house. Her friends couldn't even come to the house because Martin would always like scare them and taunt them and tease them. And again, as I said, like Martin would just do very bad things to get a laugh out of himself. And sometimes that included injuring other people in the process. And there was this one specific incident where Martin went to a public pool with his family and there was this kid that was swimming underwater and Martin just swam up to the kid and ripped off his snorkel and the kid was very taken off and he was kind of breathing in water and drowning for a second but thankfully he was able to get out of the water in time and his behavior got so bad that in 1977 at just 10 years old he was expelled from his school because of his behavior and given psychiatric evaluations One of the psychologists mentioned that when asked what Martin likes to do, Martin responded with torturing animals. So Martin took a year off of school from 10 to 11 to just get psychiatric help, to go to therapies, to manage his anger, and all of these different things. And after a year, in 1978, at 11 years old, he was able to return to school. And it was a pretty smooth transition. When Martin came back, his behavior was a lot better. Like, of course, he would every once in a while, like, taunt and tease the younger kids at his school, but for the most part, he was, like, a changed Martin. But as the days went on, it didn't really take very long to have Martin fall into his bad habits again, and he was just, you know, defiant all over again, as if all of his progress had been erased. And then in 1979, at 12 years old, he was transferred from his current school to a special education schooling at Newton High School. And so they transferred him with the sole purpose that maybe if we put him in a different school, Martin will get better. Maybe he was going to get special attention for all of his needs, but it ended up being worse than what they thought. Uh, Martin did not get better at all. He actually got a lot worse and his anger became uncontrollable to where even the typical tactics that he used to use that would help his anger weren't even working anymore. 
But not only was he failing socially um, because he didn't really have many friends and so making friends was something really, really hard for him to do. And even if he were to try and sit down to have a serious conversation, he was very quiet and awkward as if he didn't really know how to have normal conversations with people. So not only did he fail socially, he also failed academically as well. His grades were slipping and his teachers, again, weren't really helping him either because they just felt like Martin was so defiant and no one really wanted to be around him because they were just scared of what Martin was going to do to them. So then at 14 years old, uh, Martin's father, Maurice, was actually big into hunting. So Maurice, I don't know why, thought that this was a great idea to give Martin a rifle for his birthday so that Maurice and um, Martin could go hunting and stuff like that together. Now, he had good intentions because he wanted to, you know, spend some quality time with his boy, although I don't support hunting, side note, but in his head, he was like, yeah, this is something that we're going to do together, but it ended up being the worst decision he ever made because he basically just introduced Martin to the power he holds when it comes to firearms as well as teaching him how to hunt animals. And then on May 6th of 1983, the day before Martin's 16th birthday, he actually dropped out of high school. Um, But when he dropped out of high school, he had sort of a plan. He knew that, you know, school is not for him. It was never for him. He was just failing in school. It was just, you know, something that his parents had to pay for that he didn't even use. So he was like, I'm gonna just drop out of school, but I'm not just gonna like sit on my parents' couch all day. I'm actually going to go out there and do things. And then that's when he attempted at getting a disability pension from the state. So he applied for a disability pension and in order to get qualified, he needed to take a series of tests, uh, including an IQ test. So he took the IQ test and he scored a 66 on the IQ test, which if you're not familiar, the average score of an IQ test is around 100 and he scored below average and it was mostly because the people giving the IQ test realized that Martin didn't even know how to read or write. I think that just kind of like shows how much attention the teachers were really giving Martin. Of course, he was defiant, but your job as a teacher is to help that kid because that kid cannot help himself if it weren't for you being there. They found that he struggled the most with verbal slash nonverbal reasoning as well as cognitive function. So at the time, Martin was diagnosed with Asperger's, but now it is referred to as autism spectrum disorder. For those who don't know, Asperger's is no longer a proper diagnosis. They now refer it to as autism spectrum disorder. One of the psychologists who were working with Martin actually said, quote, that Martin cannot read or write, does a bit of gardening and watches TV, could be schizophrenic, and parents face a bleak future with him. So basically, they were saying that if he wants a bright future, it's not going to happen with minimal effort. He's going to have to have a lot of help in order to get there. So after this, he was approved for disability checks. But as I said, Martin had a plan. He didn't want to just sit around all day and collect his disability checks. He wanted to go out there and create something for himself. So although he was in this like mind state, he did have goals goals for himself and he wasn't gonna like let all of these things that were going on with him slow him down. So that is when he decided just at 16 years old to start his own landscaping business. And then in 1987 at 19 years old Martin had a successful and growing lawn mowing business. He had like actual employees that worked for him. He had a like patent name for it. He was going like to all all these different houses. So he had a successfully running business in landscaping. And it was actually at this job where Martin would meet 54-year-old Helen Harvey. 
Helen lived in a big mansion referred to as the Hobart Mansion. She was actually the heiress to a lottery fortune, so she had like a lot of money inherited to her from this big lottery win, um, and she lived in this mansion. It was just her and her mother. Now, when Helen met Martin for the very first time, she was very impressed with Martin being such a young age with such a successful business. She was just really blown away at Martin. And so then when Martin started working on Helen's house, he realized that Helen had not really done any landscaping at this huge mansion for a really long time. Like a lot of her outside house was extremely neglected. And so because of this, he needed to spend a lot of time there. And so since he needed to spend a lot of time there, Helen and Martin also spent a lot of time together. So then the two eventually, after spending so much time together, became friends. They would frequently go out to lunch, spend their free time together, have deep conversations. And then one day, an anonymous phone call was made to health authorities to complain about Helen's living conditions. The anonymous caller told health authorities that she had 14 dogs, over 40 cats. There was waste all over the inside of her house, the outside of her house. She is not cleaned in years. And so the police follow up on this and they go to Helen's house and find out that that was all true. Her outside was very neglected. You know, as I said, the landscaping had not been done in years. The inside was also very, very neglected. There were things all over the place. Like you couldn't even really walk through the front door without stepping on something. And as I said, this was a mansion. So there was a lot of space in this house and there was just junk everywhere. So after this, they actually realize that with the state of the house, it is actually affecting the health of Helen and Helen's mother. So they take Helen and Helen's mother, they remove them from the house, and they send them to the hospital to see if they had suffered any, you know, consequences from their living conditions. Once they were sent to the hospital, all of the animals were taken from Helen and Helen was forbidden to have any more animals in that house. And if she were to have any animals in the house, like not even a fish was allowed in that house. And if she were to be caught with an animal in that house, she could be either heavily fined or even sent to jail. So Helen is very, very devastated by this because she absolutely loved her animals and so she was very sad and Martin felt bad for her. So Martin was like, Helen, I'm going to go to your house. I'm going to clean up everything. So by the time you get out of the hospital, me and my dad, like, we'll have the place spotless. So when you come home, it's going to look so beautiful. Like, you're going to feel like you're walking into a brand new house. Like, Martin just genuinely wanted to take care of Helen. But unfortunately, while Helen and Helen's mother were in the hospital, Helen's mother ended up passing away. And so Helen was lucky enough to survive. And when she left the hospital, she was already really heartbroken over her mother's death. And when she came home, the whole house was spotless. Like there was no trash, there was no papers, there was no nothing anywhere. And so this, of course, like was a nice thing, you know, know like it was super clean it was smelt amazing in there but she just couldn't help but feel very lonely because she was you know living in this huge mansion with her mother before but now there's nothing there there's no mom there's none of like her clutter or anything to keep her you know feeling comfortable and safe it was just open and she grew very depressed over this and then Martin realized that you know Helen was very distraught over all of this and so that's when Helen asked Martin if he would be willing to move in with her you know he would have his own room his own bathroom there's this huge house so much space you could move in you know like we could just you know be roommates and Martin agreed so he packed up his things out of his parents house and moved in with Helen. I know what you're thinking was something going on. You know, you see a relationship like this, you see Helen, you see Martin, is something going on? From what I've read, and I read a lot about this case, 
I couldn't find anything that was like concrete evidence that something was going on. From what I could read, everything was extremely friendly and just friends. None of that funny business went on. Martin just kind of looked up to Helen as a motherly figure and Helen looked at Martin as a son figure and that was it. They were just, you know, really good friends. They would spend every single day together. They would wake up in the morning and get ready together. They would drink coffee and have breakfast. They would go to a nice lunch every single day and then in the evenings they would spend their days going shopping. The two also went on many expensive trips, all being funded by Helen, of course, and over the next three years, Helen bought over 30 different cars. So it seemed like Helen and Martin were just kind of blowing money as much as they could. So later on that year, uh, Martin is 20 years old at this point, um, it came time for Martin to be reevaluated for his disability checks, and so a psychologist psychologist found some concerning things regarding Martin's mental state. The psychologist noted that Martin's father primarily protects Martin uh, from situations where he could get mad or violent. Martin also continuously threatens violence and Martin even told the psychologist one time that he would love to go out one day and shoot people instead of animals. So the doctors hearing all of this, it sounds like Martin is quite literally a danger to society if someone tells you that they have murderous tendencies probably not the best idea to just like have them out in the public whilst they're in this mind state I feel like in that situation you need to take action maybe bring them into a mental hospital take care of them give them medicine whatever they need to do you know but instead they asked the parents because the parents were like hey we just heard all this stuff from Martin and we don't think it's a good idea that he is spending time with Helen because, you know, Helen is an old lady. She can't really defend herself if Martin were to, you know, like do something to her. So the parents felt like it was no issue. The parents actually liked that Martin lived with Helen because they felt like, you know, it was Martin getting out of the house. Martin was able to have a new friend finally. As I said, Martin never really had luck with finding friends. So they thought that this was good for Martin. You know, he went out there, he's living independently, he's figuring out his own life and finding himself. And when the doctors asked Helen, you know, has Martin ever tried to do anything to you, any violent things? And Um, And Helen says no, like literally Martin is so sweet to me. He does nothing but good to me. Um, I've never felt scared or threatened around him. No violent things have ever went on. Like I feel completely safe living with him. So it seems like Martin was very violent only towards strangers but when it came to the people that he loved like Helen and his parents he was very protective and didn't really act out as much on them as he did with other people. So later down the road, Helen is getting to a point where she really misses her animals. As I said, she had over 40 cats, 14 dogs, like she misses her animals. And the police had told her that she cannot have any animals at that house. So Helen decides to just buy a whole other house. She ends up buying a 72-acre farmhouse in Copping, Australia. It's like a small little farming town. And she didn't sell the Hobart Mansion. She now just has two homes. So she bought a farmhouse and so she was able to have a house to keep all of her animals at and that's exactly what she did. She got the house and she got a bunch of dogs and cats. But when they lived on this farmhouse, they found themselves living more at this farmhouse than the actual mansion itself. Helen really found a lot of passion in gardening and farming and taking care of her animals. Like she just felt like, you know, the country life was for her and same thing with Martin. As I said, Martin loved to hunt. So with all of that acres of land, he was able to practice his hunting a lot more. But that, of course, had a downside because as I said, when it comes to Martin and guns, it's 
not the best. Um, he feels this like power dynamic when he has a gun in his hand and he started buying a lot more guns to where he started a collection with his guns. He actually had an air gun and would carry it around with him all over the place. There were a lot of witnesses that said that he would typically torment people with this air gun. So at night, he would go into like the main city area and just fire the air gun at people because people thought that it was a real gun. And he said that he loved to see the panic on people's faces when they thought it was a real gun. And Martin would just laugh whenever people would get scared or anything, even though it was not funny. Like people genuinely thought that he was a guy walking around with a gun, but he thought it was hilarious because it was just an air gun instead of a real gun. He would also go into to small markets as well, like little farmers markets, and again, just shoot at random people. Also at night, he would go into the neighbor's yard and shoot the air guns at their dogs just to make them bark because again, he thought that it was really funny when the dogs would get mad. So he thought it was also funny when the dogs would bark as well, and that's what he would do. So then on October 20th of 1992, when Martin was 25 years old, Helen and Martin were driving in the car one day with their two dogs while Helen was driving. Now, Helen had actually spoken to a neighbor about this one time um, that the neighbor actually like came forward about later on, but Helen and this neighbor were talking and they were talking about Martin. So, Helen had told the neighbor that although Martin was never physically violent to her, he would do violent things that would just make him laugh um similar to like the air gun thing like it wasn't harmful but it was very scary and that's what Martin would do a lot to Helen and there was this one thing that Martin would do is that if Helen was driving he would jerk the steering wheel and make her drive off the road a little bit just to watch her panic and again he would just laugh at it and he would do this very often so um, it was said that Helen had to keep her speed to 35 or 40 the highest because just in case he did that they didn't actually get damaged. So as I said one day Helen's driving Martin's in the passenger and they got their two dogs in the back they're driving and Helen quickly veers off to the side of the road and it was the other side of the road where people were driving in the opposite direction of her and she ended up crashing headfirst into the vehicle on the other side. Helen, Martin, and the two dogs were immediately sent to the hospital and Martin ended up having to be hospitalized from this incident for a whole seven months because that's how bad the crash was. Like they, they crashed head on with each other like the windshield had crashed and this was during the 90s too where airbags weren't as like safe as they are now so Martin and Helen and the two dogs just got badly badly injured from all of this and so when the police were asking around to figure out what happened maybe Helen had saw something in the road that's when they heard the story of how Martin would frequently you know jerk the steering wheel wheel. So when the police asked Martin about this, Martin refused. He was like, that did not happen. Like, yes, I do that sometimes, but in this situation, that did not happen. I didn't do that. And what kind of like made the police think that that is what happened is because they were looking at Helen's records and they found that Helen had actually gone into three different car accidents prior to this one, basically because, as I said, Martin would just randomly jerk the steering wheel. And so the police assumed that was the same situation for this one, but since this is the worst outcome they've had from this, where they had to be hospitalized for months, Martin didn't want to confess to it. So um, while Martin was in the hospital, Martin's dad, Maurice, actually stayed at the farmhouse to take care of all of the animals and tend to the land while they were gone. 
Now, unfortunately, due to this accident and also due to Helen's age, um, she unfortunately passed away as well as the two dogs. Now, because of Helen's death, Helen's assets totaled a little over $1 million and in her will, she specifically asked her over $1 million asset to be given only to Martin. Because Helen didn't have any kids, she also didn't have a husband. She didn't really have much family either. She had her mother, but that was it. And as I said, her mother passed away. So she just left everything to Martin, including the farmhouse and the mansion. So Martin hears this news and he is very excited to get out of the hospital because he's like, wow, when I get out of this hospital, I'm going to have two homes, millions of dollars. But of course, Martin's mom, Carlene, she steps in and she's like, no, you're not. Like, there is no way that I am letting you handle over a million dollars. So Carlene, whilst Martin is still in the hospital, goes to the court and she shows all of these documents of of how Martin is clearly not in the right mind state to be handling that much money. So the court agreed and basically took all of Martin's money, even the money that Martin had in him and Helen's joint bank account, and gave all of it to Carlene. So it was now all in Carlene's name. Although Carlene wasn't going to keep it for herself, she was just going to make sure he doesn't spend it all at once. So seven months later, when Martin is released, he gets to the farmhouse and finds out that all of the money that was left for him is now in his mom's name. I couldn't really find anywhere his reaction to all of this. I'm not really sure if he was angry or understanding. I mean, I hope he was understanding. So then on August 14th of 1993, two months after Martin being home, Martin's dad, Maurice, Maurice's friend actually went to the farmhouse because he was going to meet Maurice there. But when he got there, he noticed that Maurice's car is in the driveway, yet Maurice is nowhere to be found. So he's kind of looking around the house and that's when he finds a note taped to the front door that says, quote, call the police. So after this, um, Maurice's friend looks into Maurice's car and he sees on the front seats and the back seats thousands of dollars all in cash. So he thinks this is really, really weird. So he does what the note says and calls the police. The police get there and they investigate the area and same thing with Maurice's friend. They cannot figure out where Maurice had gone. They question Martin and his mom, Carlene. But again, and they didn't really offer any leads as to where they think Maurice might be. So there was actually four dams surrounding the farmhouse. So they sent out a diving team to investigate the dams to make sure that he wasn't there. So two days later, after diving into the dams, that is unfortunately when they found Maurice at the bottom of the nearest dam towards the house with a weight tied around his neck. But from the state of his condition, the medical examiners deemed that this was a suicide. Now, from Maurice's death, Martin inherits um, a little under $500,000 from his father's death, and so Martin just decides to sell the farmhouse. He finds that it's way too traumatic to live there, and so he sells the farmhouse for $143,000 and just moves in full-time at the mansion. So, after Helen's death and his father's death, it was really hard for Martin to to cope with all of this at once. As I said, he really loved Helen and he also really loved his dad. So this was just super hard for him to take in all at once. And also Martin didn't really have any like, friends that he could go to about this. It was literally just him and Helen. So that is when after his father's death, he started to change his whole demeanor. He thought that maybe if he looked different, then possibly he could get some friends. So after this, he started only wearing expensive suits everywhere he went, as well as lizard skin shoes, just like the most expensive of outfits, the outfits that get him the 
most attention and he would often go out to restaurants or clubs and talk to strangers and brag about this business that he didn't really have and basically just lied to people saying that he had this really successful business and you know it was booming and he has all this money and this big mansion but wouldn't tell anyone how he got that mansion or how he got that money. Now, these conversations didn't really make anyone feel comfortable. They actually felt very uncomfortable that Martin was, you know, just talking to them randomly and just bragging about how well his business is doing. And so, due to this, there really wasn't any friendships that were formed. And there was actually a specific restaurant that Martin would frequently go to and kind of talk to all of the people there. But every time he would go, he would wear this, like, bright bright blue like matching blazer and slack pantsuit along with like this white ruffled shirt underneath the blazer kind of like um like something Harry Styles would wear you know but back in the day that was like it wasn't seen as like oh that's so cool um sort of a Harry Styles aesthetic back in the day it was more of like oh ew why do you look like Austin Powers. So, because of this, he was very heavily made fun of. He was laughed at in the restaurant, and the restaurant staff knew that this Martin guy probably didn't have a lot of friends because he was in this restaurant every single day, and every time he would come in, he was always by himself. He would always order for himself. So, the restaurant staff tried to be nice to him and welcome him because they felt bad that Martin was not only getting getting teased but he also just had no friends to hang out with him and so from 1993 to 1995 Martin really tried to get out there and make friends but he just couldn't for some reason he didn't know what it was but he felt like he just had this aura about him that whenever he tried to talk to people people just saw him as a creep and didn't want to talk to him or didn't want to be friends with him or if he tried to spark up a like friendly conversation with someone it would always just come out as really awkward and weird even though he wasn't intending it to be that would just how he spoke and so it was very hard for him to find friends and over the next two years in 1993 to 1995 he spent most of his time traveling in hopes of finding a friend he traveled to 14 different places all overseas and said that he hated every single one of them. He said that every time he tried to make a friend in a new country, it was either just like a huge language barrier to where he couldn't even talk to the person or everyone just found him really awkward to talk to. They felt very uncomfortable when he would talk to them and just overall people tended to avoid Martin. Even if like a group of people saw that Martin was talking to random people, they would just kind of like, look as if they were busy so that they didn't have to talk to him but in reality like Martin just really really needed a friend and he really wasn't that close to his mother or his sister so he really just didn't have anyone like all he wanted was just someone to talk to him. Martin also said that when he went on his trips, the only part that he did enjoy about his trips were the plane rides because on the plane rides, he was either always sitting next to one person or if he was lucky, he would get a middle seat and speak to two people. And he said that he loved the plane ride so much because he was basically, you know, forced to talk to people. Like they couldn't leave. They couldn't get up. They were basically forced to sit sit there and listen to him and although it was probably very uncomfortable for them Martin just enjoyed some sort of human interaction because he really had none when he was home So when he got back home from traveling so, so much, he decided to just spend a lot of alone time with himself. But when he did, he picked up on drinking. So he started to drink very, very heavily, thinking that maybe if he was drunk, he would get more friends. But same thing happened when he was sober. So he just tended to drink so he could forget. And during this alone time, he would also 
build up his gun collection as well. He would practice his shooting um, at shooting ranges and in different fields as well as, now this was a really odd detail too. The police found like after everything happened, they found that Martin owned a bunch of bestiality films, like illegal bestiality films. I just thought that was really odd because he had a lot of animals. As I said, Helen had a bunch of dogs and cats at the farmhouse. He sold the farmhouse, so I'm assuming he brought the animals to the mansion. That was a really odd detail. Um, but before moving forward, I do want to say real quick that with everything that I'm telling you, it's very easy to feel bad for Martin. And I'm not saying like, oh, everybody feel bad for Martin. Of course, Martin was going through a rough patch, but that in no way justifies what he's about to do. There are many, many people that go through very, very similar situations as him and never do anything close to what he's about to do later on. So I don't want you guys to like have lots of sympathy for him or point him as the victim in this situation. Of course, he could have gotten a lot more help. There are a lot of killers that, you know, kill and it could have been prevented if they were given more help. But in Martin's case, like, yes, he could have gotten more help, but it definitely does not justify what he, the like horrific crime that he's about to do. I just wanted to make that clear because even like researching this case, like I was reading about his story and I was like, oh my God, this is sad. Like, this is so terrible. I feel bad. And then I remembered what he did and I was like, mm, don't really feel bad anymore. So yes. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Hello everyone, don't worry, it's still me, just in sponsorship mode. So if you're a big fan of this podcast or anything similar to this podcast, such as murders, disappearances, cult, then you are going to love the This Is Actually Happening podcast on Wondery. From Wondery, This Is Actually Happening is a podcast that brings you extraordinary true stories of life-changing events told by the people who lived them. Every week, host Wit Misseldine dies into these incredible stories from a young man that dooms his entire future family with one choice to a woman that barely survived her roommate. You'll hear an intimate first-person account of how they overcame their remarkable circumstances. Each episode is an exploration of the human spirit and personal discovery. These haunting accounts sound like Hollywood movies, but I assure you, this is actually happening. Follow This Is Actually Happening on Amazon Music or wherever you can get your podcasts or listen ad-free by joining the Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. So imagine it's a stormy night outside, the fire is crackling, and your power is out due to the storm. What else is there to do besides sitting in front of this fire? Oh, well, cuddling up with the best game ever, Best Fiends. Best Fiends is a free-to-download casual mobile puzzle game with thousands of different fun and exciting levels and new challenges every time you play. Brand new events and challenges pop up all year round, so you've always got a chance at winning exclusive items, characters, and rewards. You collect cool fiends and customize your team of fiends to defeat the menacing slugs. You can even power up your favorite fiends to get more powerful skills and watch them transform as they get stronger. Even if you lose internet, Best Fiends has offline play so the fun never has to end, like when your power is out due to this crazy storm. It's an easy and casual game to play whenever you're you're waiting in line, taking your lunch break, or just bored. I'm currently on level 37 and you can get Best Fiends free on the Apple Store or Google Play and even get $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's Best Fiends like friends but without the R. <laughs> So then in 1995, when Martin was 28 years old, um, he grew very, very depressed because of everything going on. He, he actually attempted to off himself and he was not successful in this attempt. But when he was asked by doctors why he attempted to off himself, he said, quote, I just feel like more people are against me. When I tried to be friendly towards them, they just walked away. This became an everyday occurrence. 
The Martin's substance abuse issues with alcohol got even worse. He was just drunk all day long. He would wake up early in the morning. You know, usually people drink to feel better, but he just drank and felt worse. And so the more he felt bad, the more he drank. Martin would also often conversate with his neighbors as well. And during one of the conversations with his neighbors, he said something along the lines of, one day I am going to do something that will make everyone remember me. So remember how I said that Martin didn't really have any friends? Although he didn't really have many friends, Martin actually in the year of 1995 dated two different girls um, by the names of Mary and Petra. He dated Mary first and they dated for about eight months and Mary uh, came out to Sunday night, I believe, like some news outlet. I think it was like Sunday night or Sunday line, something similar to that, but she did an interview with them. Um, it also, all of my sources will be linked in the description box below. So if you ever want to like go ahead and do your own research, the description of the YouTube video, you can get all that information. But um, she did an interview with them and she described her relationship with Martin to be very like nice, just like a normal relationship. The weird thing about it was Mary was 16 and Martin was 27 when they started dating. So super weird, super, you know, pedophilic, super groomy. Um, that was a detail that was just slightly glossed over in the article, um, but it is one to mention, most definitely. So yeah, she was 16, he was 27. Um, she says that Martin was a very childish but nice person. Uh, she said that he truly did care for the people that he loved. There was this one time where um, Mar Martin and Mary went on on a boat and at one point their boat had like unlocked somehow and was like drifting off into the ocean and Martin started freaking out because I don't think he knew how to swim and he started crying and he felt really bad for Mary and he genuinely thought that they were going to die. Like they were going to drift off into the ocean and never see the world again and that they were going to die and it was going to be his fault. And he started crying to Mary. And so Mary said that he was a very emotional person when it came to the people that he loved. Um, he felt very deeply for the people that he loved. And so after this incident, Mary felt like, you know, Martin really cared about her. So that's why their relationship went on for as long as it did. She also said that Martin loved collecting teddy bears and dolls. He had over 200 teddy bears in the mansion and his favorite movie was Chucky because because Chucky is about, um, it's basically like a horror movie about a killer doll. But after eight months of dating, the couple eventually broke up after Martin asked Mary to marry him and she declined because she was only, she was so young. I think she was like 16 going on 17 or maybe already 17 at the time. So she just felt like they were moving a little bit too quick for her. Like she had all these different plans for herself and her future and being married was going to kind of stop her from doing that. So that is when the couple broke up. Shortly after him and Mary broke up, that is when he started dating a woman named Petra. Petra describes Martin to be very, you know, similar to what Mary said. He is very childish and he likes childish things, but he can be very, very emotional when it comes to his own life or hurting the people that he loves. Petra also noted that Martin had a big gun collection and would spend most of his time in the field practicing his shooting. So there was this couple uh, by the name of David and Nolene, aka Sally. David and Sally owned a bed and breakfast called The Seascape. Now what's important about The Seascape is that prior to David and Sally owning it, uh, Martin's father, Maurice, really wanted to buy it because he said that at the time, you know, it was well-priced and he felt like it was something that him and his wife, Carlene, could do together because at the time, 
time like their marriage was kind of in a rough patch and so he felt like maybe by buying this place it was something that him and Carlene could do together and it could help their marriage and it would bring in a lot of money because the bed and breakfast was apparently in like a very big city sort of place or like near a big city so it was the perfect location but unfortunately while Martin was saving up to buy the place that is when David and Sally had swooped in and bought the place. Now, David and Sally had no clue as to who Maurice was. They didn't know that someone else was attempting at buying the place. They just saw the place, fell in love with it, just like Maurice, felt like it was something that they could do together. The couple was also an older couple, like nearing retirement. So they felt like, you know, same thing with Maurice, like this was something that they could do together. It was near a city area, so it was in a great location. It was well-priced and so then they just bought it and so then Maurice once he found out that someone had bought the place he was very devastated about it he would um rant very frequently to Martin about it saying that you know oh that sucks like it was the perfect place I really wanted to you know have this place for me and your mother to really like take care of something together like I miss that another one bites the dust sort of situation like it wasn't that big of a deal but it was kind of of a big deal and so from what I read like it just seemed like Maurice was just sort of ranting like ah that sucks but in Martin's head he kind of took this to the extreme and he visualized the situation as this couple David and Sally who again had no clue who Maurice was didn't know that anyone was trying to like fight to buy this place um he Martin thought that this couple had purposely bought the Airbnb with the intention to hurt his father's feeling which again David and Sally did not know who Maurice was so Martin was just making up this story and so when Martin started to think about the situation more intensely Martin also started to blame the couple for causing his father's death as I said his father's death was deemed a suicide so since you know his father was one of the only people that he was very close to and then he died and then Helen died another person he was super close to Martin just grew grew very very angry at the couple and blamed the couple for his father's death and so that is when his frustration grew to an all-time high and he felt like he needed to do something about it. So then on April 28th of 1996, that is when Martin had set an alarm that morning for 6 a.m. and it was on the same night that Petra had actually spent the night, Martin's girlfriend. So Petra had spent the night that night and she thought it was kind of odd that Martin set an alarm because he usually never uses an alarm clock, but they've only been dating at this point for a couple of weeks. So she was like, oh, well, maybe this is just a thing that he does sometimes. So Petra actually asked Martin, and like hey like you use an alarm clock I didn't know that and Martin was like oh I only use an alarm clock on the days that I'm going surfing so this is just what she thought of that and she said that the morning went pretty normal like they both took showers they had breakfast together and then shortly after breakfast Martin had a duffel bag and a surfboard with him and loaded up his car and um, Petra kind of did the same thing she walked over to her car because she was going over to her parents house the couple said bye to each other and they went their separate ways now what Petra didn't know was what was inside of the duffel bag she assumed that you know it was probably just his surfing suit a change of clothes a beach towel you know things like that but in reality in the duffel bag was three guns and a Colt AR-15 semi-automatic. So he left the house and he went to a nearby shop where he bought a cigarette lighter, a bottle of tomato sauce, a cup of coffee, and $15 worth of gas. So at 11.45 a.m., that is when Martin showed up to the seascapes and when he walked in, he saw David and Sally were alone. So he 
he shot both of them dead. Now, a lot of articles say that he just shot them, but then there are other articles that say that um, the reasoning of death for David and Sally was a blunt force trauma to the head and then shot. So, it's believed that Martin walked in there and hit them over the head before shooting them, but other articles say that they were just shot. I personally think that he hit them over the head and then shot them because I just see more evidence associated with that. I just wanted to bring up both of the like things that I saw just so you guys like don't get confused if you go ahead and do your own research about it. So shortly after he had killed David and Sally and he checked their pulses to ensure that they were dead, that is when um, a couple had pulled up in the driveway of the, of the seascapes because they were in hopes of getting a place there, like um, a room. So Martin runs out immediately because he thinks that it's the police, but it's not the police. It's just this random couple. So Martin comes out and he says, hey, I'm the son of David and Sally just to let you guys know like we're not taking any rooms today we're actually closed my parents are out and they're usually the ones that show the rooms to people so the couple is like you know we're kind of in a rush right now if you can like take us in there just to look at a room like I'm sorry we just really need a place to stay and Martin from the couple's um testimony says that Martin came off as extremely rude he was very demanding and the couple just felt like very uncomfortable because they were like this person is so rude we're getting out of here so they just drove off and left and so did Martin. Martin just left David and Sally there and didn't do anything so he just simply got back in his car with his gun and drove off as well. So after this, he drove to Port Arthur, which is a little town in Tasmania, and at 1.30 p.m., that is when he arrived in Port Arthur and went into a cafe called Broad Arrow Cafe, which had to like 60 to 70 people in there. He ate lunch out on the balcony and chatted with a couple of people there, mostly tourists, once he's done with his lunch, he cleans up his table and he takes his tray and he goes inside to put his tray away. And whilst he's inside, he notices that there's an empty table in the back corner of the restaurant. So he sits down at the empty table. He pulls out a video camera, presses record, and that is when he takes out his Colt AR-15 and starts shooting. The two people that he shot first were these two Malaysian tourists uh, named Mo Yi Neng and So Lang Chung. And once they were shot, both of them were unfortunately killed immediately. And within the next 15 seconds, Martin had shot 17 more times. And in the process, he killed 10 more people and severely injuring 10 more people. Martin then walks over to the gift shop side of the cafe. And it was in there where he killed 8 more people and severely injuring 2 others. He walks outside because he wanted to go to his car and drive somewhere. So there were people in the parking lot and they heard the gunshots from inside. But this part of Port Arthur, it was like a very historical place where they would frequently do World War uh, reenactments. When they heard the gunshots far in the distance, they just assumed that it was some sort of World War reenactment. And that is until Martin walks out into the parking lot and as he's getting into his car, he continues to shoot at more people. In the parking lot, he shot and killed four more people and injuring another six. He was just aimlessly shooting. He wasn't trying to get at anyone specific. He was killing men, women, children, and animals. He gets in his car and drives off and whilst he's driving, he realizes that there were a lot of people that saw him drive off in this car, so he'll need to switch cars. That is when he pulls over to the side of the road and he sees a woman and her two children 
walking. So he randomly just walks up to the mother and her two children and shoots the mother and the child that she was holding. So unfortunately, both of them had died instantly when they were shot. And the oldest um, daughter that was like walking beside the mother had ran off. And so Martin chased the girl down and shot her dead with just one shot. After this, he ran further down the road and that is when he spotted a gold BMW and so he walked up to the BMW and shot all four people that were in the car and so he took the car and drove off. He drives a very short distance before finding a parked white Toyota with a couple inside because he realizes that a gold BMW is probably a little too flashy. It'll make him look more suspicious. So he gets out of the BMW and he walks up to the white Toyota and he forces the man who's sitting in the passenger side to get out of the car and go into the trunk of the gold BMW and so once the man does that, Martin just shoots and kills the woman that was sitting and driving. So he gets into the gold BMW and he drives off. Even though his intention was to like get the white car, he still drove off in the gold BMW. So I think in this moment, he's just kind of doing things to do things. So then at 2 p.m., just 30 minutes after the first shot was made at Port Arthur, Martin drives them to the bed and breakfast, the Seascapes, and it was there where he forced the man to get out of the trunk and he sets the gold BMW on fire. Minutes after arriving at the Seascapes, though, that is when the police shows up because they got a bunch of calls from literally everyone. So they show up and a Immediately when they do show up, Martin drags the man inside, handcuffs him to a stair rail, and just leaves him there so he now has this man as a hostage. So since Martin has a hostage in there, this man uh, handcuffed to the stair rail, no one knows that Sally and David are dead. No one knows that Martin had shot them earlier. So the police in their head think that Martin has three hostages, Martin, Sally, and this man, when in reality, he just had this man. So because they thought that there was three hostages involved, the police did not open fire on Martin because they were fearful of what Martin would do so they instead just kind of stood outside and so then at 2 10 p.m that is when a woman from the ABC network called the bed and breakfast to ask Martin some questions about the killing which oh my god how disrespectful can you be I just okay another side note about this I've heard this so many times in other like stories as well where something um will be going on like a shooting or a murder had just happened and once the press get a hold of like who this person is they called they call the person they call the murderer to ask them a couple of questions for their article and this is not like the only situation where that happens this happens even to this day like all the time news outlets will call murderers right after the murder happened just to get like an inside scoop on their mind which is so so disrespectful it's so disgusting and it's so selfish too they were so concerned with their own story that they were putting a man's life at risk because of it. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up and why I'm so frustrated about this is because the police on the outside, since they couldn't really get on the inside and talk to Martin, they were trying to call the bed and breakfast. They were trying to call Martin on his cell phone, but they couldn't because this news outlet was taking up Martin's phone call. So because of the ABC network calling Martin, the police weren't 
able to do their job and try to get that hostage out alive. That's why I'm so frustrated that the ABC network did that. I just think that's super disrespectful. I think that's super disgusting and selfish whenever news outlets do something like that because it's like you are putting someone's life at risk. You're putting someone's son, someone's daughter, someone's mom, someone's dad. Like their life is at risk. They have a family to go home to, but just because you want a couple of quotes for your article that's probably only going to like be popular for a couple of months I don't know like that whole thing is so so frustrating to me and that frustrated me a lot when I read that but when Martin was on the phone with this woman from ABC he introduced himself as Jamie and he answered several questions before eventually just getting fed up with the woman and he threatened to kill the hostage if she were to call here again and so he hangs up the phone. Shortly after, that is when the police finally get a hold of Martin, and so the police are trying to negotiate with Martin. And so as the police are trying to negotiate with Martin, trying to come to a mutual agreement, maybe get Martin to come out and surrender, Martin says that the only way he will come out is if he is immediately taken away on an army helicopter, taken to the airport, and allowed to flee the country. So basically, he's just asking the police, hey, can you help me flee from my crime? So I don't know if there's like, like legal things that you can do in this situation. I don't know why the police were like, yeah, we'll do that and then just take them to jail. I don't know if they're allowed to do that because I noticed that in a lot of hostage situations, they have to come to an agreement instead of just like lying to them in order to get them out of there. And so the police, they refuse this and they're like, no, we're not going to do that. And so they end up being on the phone for hours and hours before eventually Martin's phone had died. So they had no contact with Martin on the inside. The police were outside. They were basically just around the bed and breakfast trying to make sure that Martin didn't leave. It was just the waiting game at this point. They were waiting for Martin to come out. Martin was waiting for them to come in. And this standoff lasted for an entire 18 hours following into the very next day. After 18 hours, Martin realizes, you know, I can't get out of this even if I tried. So he attempts at lighting the bed and breakfast on fire in hopes of creating a distraction so he could run away. But when he did light the bed and breakfast on fire, he actually caught fire onto his clothes. So when he ran out of the bed and breakfast, he immediately just fell on the floor because his clothes were on fire. And so due to this, the police were able to, you know, take out the fire that was on him, but immediately arrest him afterwards. So Martin was immediately sent to the hospital after this uh, to treat his severe burns, but unfortunately, when the police went inside, they saw that Martin and Sally were already shot, as well as the hostage that was chained to the stairwell. So then on November 7th of 1996, later on that year, that is when Martin's trial began. He at first pled not guilty until his lawyers had persuaded him to plea guilty. So all in all, Martin had unfortunately killed 35 people and injured 23. And this was actually at the time the largest mass shooting in all of Tasmania. So since Martin had pled guilty, there was really no trial for him. It was just a sentencing. And so the court had sentenced him to 35 different life sentences plus 1,652 additional years in prison without possibility of parole. This was also the very first murder case in all of Tasmania that had a prison sentence without the possibility of parole because all of the murderers at this point who had been tried for their crimes had a possibility of parole, but this was the very first time where it was like, no, you're gonna die in here. 
here. It was very clear that Martin showed no remorse for what he did or his actions because even during his interrogation and afterwards at his trial, he would often make jokes about what he did and the lives that he took. He would make very sick jokes about the panic on people's faces and that it felt like an adrenaline rush to him. To live out his sentence, he was sent to Hobart's Risden Prison and was placed into a specially built cell which was basically like a glass box like from the show you joe's box that's basically what martin lived in for the first eight months of his sentence and it was due to just martin being such a violent person um they weren't able to tell what martin would do to himself or others so they heavily surveillanced him for an entire eight months and he stayed in this box until he was later placed into solitary confinement he was placed into solitary confinement for a whole 10 years and then in 2006 he was moved to a different prison but still in solitary confinement Later on that year, in November of 2006, he was moved to a mental health unit part of the prison, so he was, like, now interacting with other people. In this mental health unit, his violent tendencies got a lot worse because he was no longer with himself, he was with a bunch of other people, and he also had access to, like, things like a bed and utensils and stuff, so he was constantly attacking the inmates, the nurses, the security guards and during his time here he also attempted at offing himself eight different times so martin as far as 2021 that's the most recent report i could find on martin he is still being held in a max security unit prison and he is heavily medicated so to prevent any of his violent outbursts although even with his heavy medications he is still very violent and in this 2021 article it mentioned how uh, martin had recently broke the jaw of one of the nurses now, the aftermath of all of this, um, Martin's mom, to this day, still for some reason believes that her son is innocent. She basically just tells police that they have no concrete proof or evidence that Martin was at Port Arthur that day and that he committed the crimes, even though Martin literally set up a video camera to record the horrific, graphic, disgusting, terrifying crime that he did. He recorded all of that. You could clearly tell that it was Martin, but his mom just doesn't believe it. She feels like it was someone else's crime. And although Martin had even confessed to all of this, Martin had confessed to the Port Arthur massacre. He had confessed to the death of the people walking in the street, to David, to Sally, to the hostage. He had confessed to all of that, but the mom still still believes that her son is innocent and that he was forced to confess to all of that. Now, the mom's behavior in this case really reminds me of, if you guys remember, I did a case on Luca Magnata. Uh, Luca Magnata was a um, serial killer that quite literally recorded his crime so you could clearly tell that it was him he recorded his murder that he did and posted it online so he was clearly very you know guilty of this crime and even the body of the victim was found at his house so again, he was very guilty of this crime, yet Luca's mom refused to believe that it was her son. She just felt that, you know, they had the wrong guy, this cannot be right, and still to this day believes that her son didn't do a thing. And so the mom to this day still frequently visits Martin whilst he's in prison, but as for Martin's little sister, she believes Martin did this because of all the evidence involved. She believes that her mom is just in denial of all of this, and so because of all of this, the household with the little sister and the mother 
grew very, very toxic to the point where the sister just ended up moving out altogether and she even left her job. She got a new name and she moved far away from her mom. So she is now just living like a different life, a different identity because you know, like, I understand where she's coming from, so she's just, you know, she's completely, she just doesn't want anything to do with it. None of her names are on any of, like, um, any news outlets or anything as well. So, as for Petra, Martin's girlfriend, she was very shocked at all of this. She was completely sick to her stomach. She could not believe that Martin had did something like this, and Petra even came out to the press afterwards, and said that Martin was her very first boyfriend. So this definitely affected the way that, you know, she pursues other relationships. It's really hard for her to find another relationship because she, now she has really bad trust issues when it comes to men. She just has this really traumatic experience from Martin. Petra only visited Martin twice in prison when he first got there, but ever since then, she has not spoken to him. She hasn't seen him. She doesn't want anything to do with him. Now, as for today, there are some speculations that Martin had actually killed his father. As I said, his father had unfortunately offed himself when he tied a weight around his neck and then threw himself into a dam. There are a lot of like speculations that Martin had something to do with that, um, but there isn't anything to prove it. Uh, those are just, again, speculations. Now, this shooting was very traumatizing for all of the residents of Port Arthur. A lot of, like, mother and children and fathers were shot and killed that day, and a lot of them suffered a lot of PTSD from this situation. Port Arthur is not really as popular to, of a place to go to as it was before. A lot of, you know, victims of this suffered greatly from it. A lot of lives were taken that day. It was a very horrific and terrifying situation. And so, because of this tragic event, it prompted significant gun reform under the then Prime Minister John Howard via the 1996 National Firearms Agreement. So, basically, he placed laws that banned rapid fire guns from civilian ownership, except under certain restricted licenses and tightened requirements for firearms licensing, registration, and safe storage. So, basically what that means is that random civilians can no longer own rapid fire guns because they have no reason to own rapid fire guns. If you're buying guns to hunt, you don't need that type of gun. And so, they also um, tightened the requirements to own a firearm. So, now there's a lot more of a process that you have to go through through like there's a lot more like psychiatric evaluation that you have to go through before even getting a firearms license and that is the end of today's story um it was a pretty heavy one and yeah there's really nothing you can say about it like it's just it's so so terrifying to think of something like that and to just even like try to like even picture or try to feel what those people were feeling like it's terrifying. I'm glad that Martin is locked away. I'm glad that he got his penalty for all of this. I'm glad that he's staying in jail forever and there's no possibility of him coming out because what he did to just so many innocent people and like it really does hurt a lot that he had no mercy and he was just shooting even children like shooting a child is just it's so inhumane it's so terrifying and I feel like your soul has truly been lost if you could just do that and then make jokes about it afterwards it's tragic it's very it's a very intense story and so um yeah that is the end of today's 
story if you want to follow me on any of my social medias like my instagram that will be linked down below in the youtube description as well as my p.o box if you want to send me anything if you found this video interesting make sure to give it a thumbs up on the youtube version or rate it five stars on any podcast platform that you may be listening on right now but yeah so that is today's episode um again join me next week for another one i hope you guys have a good rest of your day make sure to stay safe out there it's a very very scary world we live in so just stay safe listen to your gut um and yeah i love you i love you i love you and i will see you guys next week